all of you for for coming and hearing poetry and keeping poetry a community conversation. I'm so thrilled to be part of that. And thank you so much to Malvern Books for for hosting us. And um, I'm also grateful to Alex Peppel of Able Muse, who contacted me to come and read here. And I, um, I'm just so glad to be here. So thank you all for being part of this. And we, um, this is the latest issue of Able Muse, and I appreciate the journal so much for keeping the musicality of poetry alive. Um, Able Muse focuses so much on metrical poetry and poetry that, that, uh, that celebrates the elements of form. And I fell in love with poetry because I was a singer. So it's true, I, I studied classical singing um, and ended up through that study being, uh, being exposed to so much really great poetry. And, and poetry in different languages, I, uh, I found myself falling in love with, with the act of, of singing a poem and um, having to focus on every syllable of the word and thinking about the slant of one syllable to the next through, through the act of singing. And one of the poets that I encountered when I was studying singing is Paul Verlaine, the French poet. And I was really intrigued to find in this latest issue of Able Muse a new translation of a poem by Paul Verlaine. And it's translated by a poet named Diane Fertney, and she made this exquisite translation of this poem. And what I appreciate so much about it is that she's done this difficult, difficult work of taking a poem in one language that has so much to do with sound and then creating another version of this poem in English that still somehow captures the qualities of sound that are in the original. So what I'd like to do today to begin is to read Diane Fertney's um, translation of this poem, and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna read the original French just to enjoy the sounds of this of, of this poem. This is called A Woman and Her Cat by Paul Verlaine and is translated by Diane Fertney. She was playing with her little cat, a female black, from where I sat in the shadows it was entrancing, watching the dancing, back, back, back and forth of their white hand paws by the hearth. One of them had hidden away, wicked thing, inside her kitty mittens, the murderous curved agates of her claws, sleek and slicing as razors. The other two was like so much sugar and only seemed to have withdrawn her own stinging talons. The devil, never far away, would not go cheated of his daily pay. Later, in the bedroom where it was heavier, the gloom, with her every laugh, light and bell-like in the night, but also sure and sonorous, were four bright points of phosphorus. <laughs> Wow, it's so sexy and so feline and magical. And I just wanted to, um, you know, one of the things I learned to do studying singing is to fake like I know how to speak a lot of different languages. So I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> it's really true. It's really true. I don't speak very good French, but I can, I, I can make my mouth make these sounds. And I thought you might enjoy hearing just the sounds of this poem in French, Femme et Chat. Elle jouait avec sa chatte, et c'était merveilleux de voir la main blanche et la blanche patte se battre dans l'ombre du soir. Elle cachait la chélérate sous ses mitaines de fil noir, ses meurtriers ongles d'agate, coupant et clair comme un rasoir. L'autre aussi faisait la sucrée et rentrait sa griffe acérée. Mais le diable n'y perdait rien. Et dans le boudoir où sonore, teintait son rire aérien, brillait quatre points de phosphore. <laughs> the four points of phosphorus. This is beautiful and sexy poem by Paul Verlaine in Abel Muse. So the work of translation is going on today. Other people have translated that poem, but when I looked it up on, online, I found that most of 
the translators had said goodbye to the idea of keeping the rhyme, keeping the rhythm, and yet, um, and yet, this translator, Diane Furtney, has somehow kept those elements intact and made a beautiful translation. So now I'm going to read some of my own poems, and I'm going to read a poem about a cat to begin. <laughs> of course. Can you ever forgive me? I'm like your pet cat, I can't help it. Bits of the world wing past, iridescent flutter, my paw goes out. I sink my teeth into something's neck. It goes limp in my jaw, but it twitches in my mouth, warm and alive. Then I run for you to lay it at your feet while it's still quivering like that. The thing is, I want you to eat it. And I've got to keep doing this, even if you don't. <laughs> so maybe poets are like this too. So now I'm going to read um, a sonnet that opens my little chapbook that's over there. You can check out my little chapbook called um, Small World is my little, I have a little chapbook that's full of art and um, poems about early childhood. And this is a poem called Strata. The world we see is film, a fragile plane, a thin membrane between two churning realms, one like the sky beyond a window pane, the other like the sea. Stand at the helm of any ship. Is what you see the ocean? No, only one of its translucent masks. We, get, we guess about the meaning of its motion. We gaze into an image on the glass. But drop a line down into the abyss, then reel it up, the silver writhing there. Mouths words about a cosmos only fish can witness. Launch a kite into the air. And that string, like the other string, will fight you. Then yield its flash of silver to ignite you. Hmm. Now I'm going to read another poem that, you know, I, I, I really love, um, I love formal poems. I love the tightness and interplay of one syllable against another. I love rhythm. I'm a musician, so it makes sense. But I also, um, I love poems that spread out and take a completely freer approach to rhythm. And I, um, this is a poem that goes all over the page. Um, and it's about something that I love to see. I don't, who likes to see grackles? <laughs> who hates them? I, it's, I think that there's two co kinds of people, those that like to see grackles and those that don't. I love to see them and I, I love to see the blackbirds that, that congregate in the winter in Texas and there's a, there, there, you, know, you know that there are names for different kinds of bird, bird groupings and um, starlings, um, when they're all together, are called a murmura murmuration, which I think is well named. Murmuration. I saw a flock of starlings unraveling the sky like silk skeins or black beads spilling in weightlessness or schools of fish sky swimming and more than their elastic connect the dots mesh. What mattered was the air they swam in, turning and turning, swelling and wheeling. What mattered was the air and how they made it visible. Aura and aura, our fields merge and separate like that needing mesh of birds. What matters, love, is the air itself. And another poem about something I see in the sky. And this poem is called Cirrocumulus. You saw it, didn't you? How light had strummed the sky to pearly strands. And now admit you thought of someone's ribs, how warm the bones glowed underneath the skin, and how all night you rose and fell with every even breath that person breathed. Your head lay on his chest or on her chest, and all night long you dreamed in stripes of abalone, bright and dark, to match the oscillating joy and doubt that tinge your vision of this life you share. That strobe of brilliant shadow brings to light what you would otherwise have never known, that you are moving. That in spite of what feels like suspension, stasis, utter calm, 
You're plummeting through time and space, asleep in this embrace, this little vehicle zooming along a road late in the day. The sun slanting through even rows of trees ignites the series of still photographs to motion, fluid, flickering, and real. You know all this beneath a mackerel sky. The earth is spinning so fast that your eye is like a plectrum strumming strands of light to music. Listen harder. You can hear the bands of silence between yes and no, the rows of absence in the furrowed field where you and someone cultivate a life of alternating shadows like a long glissando on an endless xylophone, a life you live together and alone. Now I'd like to read a poem that was somewhat inspired by, uh, by Allen Ginsberg's poem, um, Wichita Vortex Sutra. Who knows this poem? Well, okay, so it's, it's really magical. He, in his style of chanting, 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 Allen Ginsberg is driving in this car across, um, across Kansas and while he's in the car, he's talking to himself. I do this a lot, I don't know if anybody else does. <laughs> he's talking to himself and he begins praying to the mysteries. And he names and invokes the gods, the deities, some the, the unnameable in all of these beautiful, marvelous names. And so over and over again, he invokes the divine by different names. And I thought, I, I thought about that poem a lot when I heard it for the first time, and I ended up writing a poem inspired by that called, What Shall We Call You? Mirror baby, in whom we glimpse our own strangeness. Prophet baby, whose eyes pour out prophecy. Vision baby, whose mute tongue writhes with visions. Devourer baby, whose toothless gums gnaw the nipple. Fat Buddha baby, whose belly is the Buddha. Void baby, whose fists grip tight handfuls of emptiness. Galaxy baby, whose clenched fingers enclosed the stars. Wordless fish baby, who swam dumb and slippery out of the womb. Slimy frog baby covered in blood. Naked petal baby, unfolding pink and strong. Earthworm baby, heaved out of the ground, rosy and squirming. Scrawny bird baby, gaping for food. Wrinkled grandfather baby, whose face unfolds eons. Alien earth baby, just off the mother's ship. Wailing siren baby, sounding alarm, squalling joyous calamity. Roaring lion baby, who sings the end of the beginning of time. Fontanelle baby, whose skull is a bruised peach. Walnut baby, cracked out of, out from the broken womb like a crumpled bit of meat. Origami baby, creased like a paper lotus. Transparent vellum baby, with fingernails like flakes of paper. Chaos baby, vortex spinning around a limpid eye. Hurricane baby, swirling out of the ocean with a name. <laughs> that was my baby. And I have a poem, a sonnet I want to share with you. Um, about my son, um, when he was young, he did not want to say goodnight. He wanted did anything he could to keep me in the room. And this is a poem for him called Seal for Benjamin. You said you were afraid. You begged me stay. I stayed. Another night I would have said goodnight and kissed your face and walked away, but that night I sat longer by your bed. I wouldn't hold your hand because you would have never let mine go. I asked you rather if I should hold, hold your foot. You said I should, and so I did. I'm not a normal mother. Nor were you any ordinary child with children's monsters underneath your bed. Your ancient eyes were beautiful and wild. The cosmos broke in waves upon your head. You dove into that ocean like a seal. I swam behind you, close upon your heel. I'm going to check and see how much time. Okay. So it looks like I have time to do two more. Two more poems. This is a poem called Trading Fire. And it opens with a quote out of The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, in which one of the characters says, 
The air of ideas is the only air worth breathing. I swear that for the sake of conversation, a few of us would weather shame and sorrow and every kind of hell. We are the ones with comets incubating in our blood who won't survive the night if we do not find some black dome, some sky in which to launch the whirling fragments of our broken fire. And this is what we hold for one another, a darkness blessedly unknowable, for knowledge is our curse, our immolation, a sentience kindled to consume our clay. And this is why we seek each other out, to cast that bright grenade into the vault of blackness that is someone else's mind. And there they blaze, our meteors brave and doomed, as face to face we gaze into the void. Then darkness blooms to swallow and surround us, as something sweet and savage seals our mouths with silence, like a flood to overtake us, a silence beautiful enough to break us and by its holy magnitude remake us. And finally, I'll read um, a villanelle that I'm so thrilled was included in Abel Muse in this winter's edition. It's called Wake. What absence means depends on what is gone, what's missing. But the figure of its wake depends on what is left to carry on. And though the boat itself, once it, has, once it has drawn its slashing silver line across a lake, is absent, something's left to show it's gone. That bright wound on the water hails the dawn of afterwards, delineates the break between before and what must carry on. As water curls to seal the slit upon its face, does that effacement then unmake its meaning? That depends. What's gone is gone. Once absence and its freight have undergone their exile, nothing's left that can forsake whatever must remain to carry on. But here's the line that cannot be withdrawn, a rippling gash, all silver and opaque. Your absence hoards its meaning. You are gone, and that is what goes on.